After the signing of the Treaty of Ryswick in 1697, the western part of the island of Hispaniola, Saint-Domingue, officially became French. The rich coastal plains were covered with plantations producing sugar, coffee, indigo, and other very lucrative commodities for the metropolis. But this economic prosperity was based on a brutally oppressive system, the enslavement of hundreds of thousands of Africans torn from their homeland. Yet, despite the terror inspired by the white masters, acts of resistance and rebellion began to emerge. Slaves fled the plantations to form maroon communities entrenched in the mountains and forests of the island's interior. At first, these acts of revolt were the fruit of individuals or isolated groups that did not really represent a great threat to the slave system itself. This was to change with the arrival of a man in the middle of the 18th century who would unite these groups of maroons into a network and guide them towards more coordinated and systematic actions. His name was Francois McCandle. Francois McCandle was born in the early 18th century in Africa. However, his exact birthplace is not unanimous among historians. According to American anthropologists Mark Davis and Wyatt McGaffey, he was born in the Congo Empire. The name Makanda would come from the Congo and would have been Frenchified. Other sources identify his origin as the Atlas Mountains which stretch across the Maghreb, but contemporary researchers such as Sylvian Duf have speculated that he could be from the modern nations of Senegal, Mali or Guinea. Another point of debate is his religion. For some, his religious practices combine Congo elements and for others, his origin would rather be Muslim. The Muslim thesis seems to be supported by the fact that McCandle wrote and spoke Arabic and he often repeated the word Allah in his prayers. Later, he would say during his arrest and interrogation in Saint Domingue that Allah meant God or the Lord Jesus Christ. However, his career as a revolutionary suggests that he was well imbued with traditional African religious practices. But was he a Muslim? The Congolese origin of McCandle is the most accepted and the most likely. Data shows that other slaves landed in the Caribbean at this time and bearing the name Makanda came from the Congo-Angola territory. According to the author Rodney Salnov, it is quite possible that Makandal is a Luba, a distinct ethnic group from the Republic of Congo today. This would explain his knowledge of Arabic and Islam because the Luba or Balubas frequented the heavily Islamized Swahili merchants. It should also be noted that the Luba believed in a single creator god, which is not common in African religions. So, it seems that McCandle had a knowledge of Islam without being a practicing Muslim. McCandle drank a lot of tafia while alcohol consumption is prohibited in the Muslim religion. McCandle's education suggests that he belonged to a high-ranking African family. He could read and write, which was very rare among enslaved Africans. This suggests that he was being prepared to occupy a high position in his clan. He had a taste for music, painting and sculpture. At a very young age, he already had extensive knowledge of plants. This knowledge would later serve him to be recognized as a healer but also as a poison maker. McCandle, made prisoner, was sold and transported to Saint-Domingue. The date of his arrival in the French colony is uncertain. He was bought and enslaved on the property of Sebastian Francois Le Norman de Misi located in Limby. It was on this plantation that the first name Francois was given to him. 
He was not only appreciated by his master for his zeal and intelligence but also by his fellow slaves to whom he provided medical care having a great knowledge of medicinal plants. He often participated in the voodoo dances organized on the plantation and was known as a great seducer among women. The question of whether McCandle's hand was cut off is also a matter of debate. According to some sources, he would have lost a hand in a sugar mill accident which would have led him to escape and become a maroon leader. However, the exact details of this event are not clearly established and vary depending on the accounts. Some consider this story to be part of the legend surrounding McCandle. In the judgment of the Council of Cap relating to the condemnation of McCandle on January 20, 1758, it is written and I quote, in reparation for which he would have been condemned to make honorable amends, naked in his shirt, holding in his hands a burning torch of wax. Holding in his hands it is said. Moreover, in a letter written from Cap Francais on June 24, 1758, describing McCandle's escape attempt, we can read, the executioner himself could not believe what he saw. However, he threw himself on the criminal, whose feet and hands were tied and he was thrown back into the fire. There is no mention of McCandle's infirmity. What is certain is that McCandle, revolted in his being, will not accept his condition as a slave. He will flee to take refuge in the mountains and join the bands of Maroons. During his time as a Maroon, McCandle traveled between various Maroon communities and slave plantations, spreading his knowledge of herbalism and voodoo. He became known as a powerful Haungan and orator with supernatural abilities. His charisma and intelligence allowed him to form a vast network of supporters ready to fight for their freedom. This rebellion took shape through guerrilla tactics and poisoning, which he saw as a means of war against the oppressive colonial system. His actions caused widespread panic among white settlers and plantation owners, who feared the potential for a massive slave uprising. Beyond his military prowess, McCandle was considered a powerful voodoo priest. This gave him an aura of mystique and fear in the eyes of the French colonists and his fellow Africans. Another element strongly associated with McCandle's resistance was the use of poison. With a deep knowledge of the island's flora, he concocted powerful toxins from herbs and plants. These poisons were distributed to slaves working on the plantations, who then slipped them into the food and drinks of their masters, causing widespread illness and death among the French colonizers. Although the exact extent of McCandle's poisoning campaign is debated by historians, it spread terror into the hearts of the white population and further destabilized the colonial system. McCandle's rebellion transcended mere acts of defiance, he had a greater vision. He not only sought to secure better conditions for the slaves but also envisioned a complete overthrow of the colonial order and the establishment of black independence on the island. To achieve this, he worked tirelessly to unite disparate maroon bands and forge alliances with slaves still working on the plantations. It was this vast network that would change everything in the maroon struggle. McCandle's charisma and message of liberation resonated deeply with the oppressed population, transforming him into a messianic figure. His unwavering belief in the righteousness of his cause made him a formidable opponent of the French. McCandle apparently possessed an almost supernatural resilience. Some even claimed that he could change shape and escape capture, further reinforcing the mysticism that characterized him. For slaves and slaveholders alike, he became a symbol, a beacon of hope for the former, a harbinger of doom for the latter. Given the unprecedented unrest caused by McCandle's revolt, the French authorities made great efforts to neutralize him. In September 1757, Assam, a young slave woman, an accomplice of McCandle, captured by the French, would, under torture, reveal the hiding place of her leader. However, the exact circumstances of McCandle's capture in 1758 remain unclear and subject to debate. Accounts describe an ambush set by the colonial forces. Taking advantage of information received about his movements, the soldiers would have surrounded and captured him after a confrontation. McCandle was sentenced to be burned alive. The sentence was to be carried out on January 20, 1758, in the public square of Cap Francais, today Cap Haitian. 
On that day, a pyre had been erected in the public square and a huge crowd had gathered, eager to see the torture of this man who had defied the colonial order. The authorities, aware of McCandle's symbolic power, wanted to make his execution a terrifying example for all slaves. McCandle, arriving on the square, chained, showed no trace of fear. He was hoisted onto the post driven into the ground, and the executioner began to surround him with bundles of wood. Despite this, he harangued the crowd, proclaiming his freedom and his faith in the future victory of the slaves. His powerful voice and inflammatory words sowed trouble among the spectators, some seeing it as a sign of his supernatural power. It was then that McCandle, in a final defiance of his oppressors, attempted a desperate escape. According to historical accounts, he managed to break his bonds and rush into the crowd, sowing chaos and panic. The guards, surprised by this unexpected resistance, began to pursue him. He was caught and brought back to the stake where he would be slowly devoured by the flames. Many legends tell that McCandle was not actually burned alive and that he managed to escape from the stake by transforming himself into a mosquito or smoke. His messianic reputation fueled these legends, giving him an aura of immortality and invincibility. After McCandle's death, severe restrictions were imposed on the slaves, prohibition of traditional medicine, gatherings and trade. They banned the use of firearms even for free blacks. Many of McCandle's followers were imprisoned or executed, but the heart of the movement remained intact. Even the domestic slaves highly appreciated by the whites were deeply involved in the ongoing plots, fueling paranoia among the plantation owners. Poisonings continued for decades and slaves showed unusual insubordination, even when tortured. McCandle occupies a major place in the history of the struggle for Haitian independence as a precursor and symbol of the revolt against slavery. He was the first to lead a large-scale revolt in the colony of Saint-Domingue. It is no coincidence that the revolutionaries of 1791 chose Boisquemin located on the Lenormand de Misi plantation where McCandle was a slave and practiced religious ceremonies. This shows the importance that McCandle and his mysticism had in their eyes. At that time, McCandle was the greatest hero of the slaves who inspired their struggle and their aspirations for freedom. Toussaint Louverture was 15 years old when McCandle died and Dessalines was born eight months later. Undeniably, McCandle was the model for the next generation that would lead to independence. An independence that McCandle was the first to invoke in the colony, before American independence and before the French Revolution.